about, uh, we're going to finish up a uh, discussion of query evaluation, uh, which we started but didn't finish last uh, Wednesday, uh, sorry, last Monday. Uh, we're also going to cover uh, an area called external algorithms. That is to say, we're going to go a little more deeply uh, into algorithms that are designed to use multiple levels of the cache hierarchy efficiently. In this case, we'll be focusing on two specific levels, that is to say RAM and hard disk, but the ideas can be generalized. Okay, so uh, before I get to that though, uh, quick announcement. Uh, the first project for the course will be posted later today. Uh, it will be due in about two weeks. It should be hopefully fairly straightforward. Uh, you're going to get a bunch of Java code that expresses relational algebra queries, essentially a parse tree of relational algebra queries. And step one will be to answer queries, uh, to essentially create the, an execution strategy that answers those queries. At this particular point in time, it doesn't need to be super efficient, uh, so things like nested loop joins are perfectly okay. Uh, but you're basically going to have to implement, uh, essentially, all of the major relational algebra operators. Um, not any of the, the for super detailed ones, but uh, anyway, details will be posted later tonight. Uh, the, second, uh, the second stage of the project is that you're going to implement a parser. Um, previous years uh, have managed to do this uh, pretty easily, uh, as I understand it. Um, but I will be going over uh, sort of how, how you go about writing a parser on, uh, on Friday. And there's a couple of utilities that will uh, that make it actually fairly straightforward to, to do that. And the main challenge here is going to be essentially creating some sort of uh, layer that automatically translates uh, between SQL and relational algebra. So anyway, um, I'll be posting uh, the details tonight, and sort of the, the unofficial start date of the project is going to be Friday. So have a look at it, and if you have any questions. Um, Come to, uh, come to class on Friday ready to, to, ask, to ask them. Okay, so uh, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get to, uh, let's get to covering, uh, reviewing what we covered last Monday. Um, so the main thing we covered was various algorithms for implementing certain relational operators. Uh, one of these, uh, probably the most simple of them, was the nested blue joy, which essentially um, are there any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so one of the simplest of these is uh, the nested loop join, which essentially implements Cartesian cross product. Um, now any, any sort of uh, join predicate that you want to implement on top of that, you'd essentially have to implement as a selection uh, on top of the nested loop join. Now this tends to have a fairly high cost. Um, basically, the number of operations you need to perform is roughly corresponds to uh, the product of the sizes of the relations. Um, and as it turns out, if, uh, if one of those two relations doesn't fit entirely in memory, you end up doing a whole bunch of I.O. that is, uh, well, that's, that slows things down even further. So uh, how do we go about making these joins more efficient? Well, uh, one solution was to minimize the I.O. costs by performing uh, what we call a block nested loop join. And the idea here was to uh, minimize the I.O. cost by sort of uh, using all of the, the using all of your I.O. as efficiently as possible. Uh, divide each relation up into chunks, and then perform a nested loop join on each pair of chunks. Um, but okay, that's that's still potentially fairly inefficient. You're still generating a whole bunch of tuples that you don't necessarily need. So if you're doing a join between officers and ships, and you have a selection predicate on top of it, uh, such as uh, the ship that the officer is on, uh, then you're going to generate at this stage, basically after the join operator, uh, this huge number of tuples. And ideally, the only tuples that are relevant are, uh, in this case, since each officer is expected to have exactly one ship, uh, you're going to generate essentially one tuple for each officer. So what we'd like to do is basically combine the two, have some sort of way of just zipping to the, the tuples that we need, uh, rather than generating this whole partition cross product. Uh, we don't want to waste effort there. So uh, how do we do that? Well, 
There are two basic strategies. Uh, one is to organize both relations in such a way that the tuples that get joined together end up in the same place. So um, when you actually do have to do the nested loop, um, you can sort of limit yourself to those tuples that are extremely likely to be joined with one another. And the two general strategies for that are to use uh, either a hash table to make sure to essentially bucket all of the tuples into the same place, or to sort the two relations so you can essentially merge them together. Uh, the other approach was to organize one of the two relations uh, so that when you scan over the other relation, you can very quickly identify those tuples that uh, contribute to the join result. Um, and the two basic strategies there uh, were to either build a hash table over one of the two relations uh, so you can very quickly identify uh, matching tuples, or uh, something that we haven't covered yet, uh, which is to build a sort of index structure over it, um, which we'll be covering in uh, class or two. Now, sort of the, the key reason for doing the latter of those two is that uh, it allows us to do what's called pipe mining on one of the two relations. Uh, so a lot of these operators, uh, you can sort of just look at one tuple in the stream at a time, and that allows us to uh, sort of uh, minimize the, the amount of I.O. that we need to do. Um, certain operators do actually need to see the entire relation, and we'd like to avoid these operators wherever possible. Uh, things like sort and distinct. Um, sometimes it's just flat out impossible not to see the entire relation like an Um Great. So uh, any questions on things up to this point? So everyone gets joints, yes? Uh, sure. So, um, recall how, uh, do you have a specific question, or do, do you want me to just be a little more specific? So what is, what is pipelining? So certain operators can, don't need to see the entire relation. Um, so if you look at the selection predicate, for example, every, uh, the selection predicate to generate Every time it generates one tuple, it looks at only one, one of its input tuples, well, some fixed number of input tuples. It can basically read, uh, you, can, you can read the input tuples one at a time until you generate uh, an output tuple. Uh, with a join on the, uh, actually, uh, with a sort on the other hand, um, you need to have the entire relation either in memory or, basically you need to consider the entire relation of performing a sort. Why do you call them uh, because the non-blocking operators um, can produce tuples without block. They're basically, the, the, the non-blocking operators don't need to see the entire relation, so they don't they don't block until the they don't block the, the, the um, generation of tuples. Um, the block, blocking uh, basically uh, blocking you should uh, interpret block in this case as stopping. Uh, so stopping the they don't stop the pipeline until the entire relation has been computed, read into memory, or, or what have you. Whereas the non-blocking operators um, do need to see the entire thing. Whereas the blocking operators do need to see the entire thing. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes? Okay. Uh, further? This one? Uh, which? Uh, this one. Relation and its 
entirety uh, rather than uh, basically create and put it in memory, put it somewhere that you can access it. Any other questions? Every time 
you uh, get a new value, you add it to the sum, and uh, you're happy. And then to, to sort of finalize that, uh, to, to get the, the actual sum, you don't need to do anything because you've already got it. Um, average is something that's a little more complex because you need to keep track of two values, uh, the total and the count. If you have the total, you have the count. Uh, you can compute the average from both of them very easily. Uh, so uh, the update operation is, is basically just going to uh, update each of those values independently. And then the finalize operation is going to actually use them to compute the average. Um, now there's, uh, there's been a fair amount of work on uh, sort of classifying, uh, deciding how to do this efficiently for more broader classes of aggregate functions. Uh, just to give you sort of a, a sense of the flavor of that kind of work. Um, aggregate functions, uh, according to a paper by Jim, the great Jim Gray, uh, fall into three basic categories. They're distributive, which, uh, for which the uh, aggregate operation is uh, both associative and commutative. Uh, they're algebraic um, aggregate operations, and they're holistic aggregate operations. And the idea here is that the distributive operations, you can basically take any, you can partition uh, the problem into smaller and smaller chunks and just sort of apply the, the update operation uh, to each uh, pair of, of, of chunks to get a bigger chunk. Uh, sum is a great example of this. Uh, so, for example, if you have, if, if your update operation is uh, is add these, these numbers together, or if your aggregate, aggregate operation is add these numbers together, then that's equivalent to first adding two numbers together, uh, or adding pairs of numbers together, and then adding uh, the, the results together. Um, algebraic uh, aggregate operations are sort of a generalization of that, where you have, where you can essentially break the computation down into smaller computations. Uh, so for example, you have uh, g of h. Um, you break the computation down into smaller chunks where you essentially compute some uh, fixed size intermediate state. Um, and the average that I just showed you was a good example of that. And finally, you have uh, certain types of aggregate operations, uh, certain types of computations that you need uh, basically an unbounded amount of state. And one really good example of this is the median operation. So median. Um, you need to essentially first sort the data and then get the middle chunk. Um, and, sorry, get the middle, uh, the, the, the center most value. Um, and sort, as we know, needs to see the entire relation. So these holistic ones are, are ones that you like to avoid in general, whereas the other two you can implement pretty efficiently using that iterator method. So okay, uh, is this all there is to aggregates? Well, this is about half, this is the first half. So half, this is how you compute the actual aggregate value. Um, perhaps a more challenging question is how do you implement uh, groups? So basically, you need to be able to uh, gather tuples together. And there's uh, two general uh, strategies to this. The first is to simply use a hash table, just build, uh, keep track of, use a dictionary or, or something. Uh, to keep track of all of the groups that you've created so far. Anytime you, you encounter a tuple, uh, you just merge it into the existing group or uh, create a new group. Uh, that works both in memory or uh, if your uh, data is, is on disk. Um, now, if, if the data is, let's, so this, this requires a full scan over the data um, to generate your, your hash table. What if the data is um, is sorted? What if you're you're trying to aggregate over uh, over a list of tuples that is sorted by the uh, by the, the group by terms? Any thoughts on how you might be able to use uh, sort order to uh, compute the group by uh, compute group by aggregates more efficiently? <coughs> 
Now you'll know that this list is, is in sorted order on the A column. How would you go about, um, uh, can you exploit that? Exactly. So you um, you can figure out that um, you, you can basically any time you see a new A, you know that you, you're starting a new group. Uh, and you, does this sound familiar to anyone? Um, something we've actually covered in class fairly recently. Uh, has anyone encountered this before? Eliminating duplicates, exactly. Um, group by, group by, uh, sorry, dis, the distinct operator is essentially a group by aggregate without an aggregate. So if I were to get rid of that, this is, a, this is essentially duplicate elimination. Okay, um, so yeah, that's the second solution. Sort all the data, and then um, you can, any, uh, are there questions? Are there questions on this? Okay. Uh, so uh, basically to summarize this, uh, this query execution uh, segment, uh, we can take any query and we can express it as this tree of relational operators and use that to express these, these sort of units of computation. Um, and basically by implementing each of these relational operators, uh, possibly using a handful of different algorithms for, uh, for different instantiations of them, uh, we can get, uh, we can essentially solve any query using these, these sort of modular components. Um, and of course the, 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 key, the key thing that we'll be addressing in, in a couple of classes is that uh, different algorithms end up having uh, different costs and different uh, requirements on, on characteristics of the input, like uh, the input is in sorted order. Um, and we're going to use that to sort of figure out and, and make estimates about which, plan, which uh, different expression of a particular query is the most efficient. Um, so basically, any questions up to this point? Okay. All right, so uh, let's move on to uh, external algorithms. So the, the big question for the day is how do we deal with uh, situations where, where we don't have enough memory to compute everything that we need to compute? And I've sort of addressed this a little bit in the last lecture where I covered um, certain kinds of join operations, for example. I kind of hinted that you, you could uh, page certain things to disk. Um, but let's, let's go a little more into depth on this with, with an example. Um, to, uh, there are two general strategies, and uh, there are two general strategies here. Uh, one is to either stream the data, and uh, yeah, the first is to stream the data, and the second is to split it up into smaller chunks. Um, now, sort of, uh, some of you may be sort of asking, uh, computers these days, and for the past two decades, have had virtual memory. Uh, not uh, limited by the size, uh, by the amount of memory that we have uh, in a computer because the computer will just page things to disk as they're not needed. Um, any thoughts on, on why, why we shouldn't uh, rely on virtual memory in this case? Well, it's uh, for, yes, for, so for this particular application, uh, why specifically isn't it necessarily the most efficient approach? Well, it's, I mean, what we're doing, what I'm going to be describing is essentially going to be on disk as well. For, but, uh, so, I mean, virtual, um, I guess we're, um, so the, the, the thing with virtual memory is that the operating system doesn't know the algorithm that you're trying to use. And as a consequence of that, it has to sort of make guesses, inferences about what kind of access patterns you'll be using. And so if 
Uh, I mean, it's operating system disease days have uh, do a great job of that, uh, but in this case, we don't need to make inferences. We know exactly the access patterns that we'll be using. So, um, an external algorithm can take advantage of those access patterns uh, to ensure that we, when we do uh, computation, we can make use of the best possible use of, of the disks. And of course, um, while I'm going to be using, uh, while well, I'm going to be giving you a, a specific example uh, in terms of hard disk and memory, these general algorithms can be adapted to other levels of the hierarchy as well. And this is going to be progressively more and more important as uh, processors keep getting faster and faster and we start getting these uh, RAM, these huge differences between processor speed and RAM speed. So, okay. Um, Two general strategies, either try and do everything in a single scan or try and partition your data into smaller chunks. And the two we'll be focusing on with this example are uh, different ways of partitioning your data. Well, actually, the example combines the two uh, pretty effectively. Um, Containing everything. 
And how many passes will we need? Log. log. Yes, log base. Uh, to give you a more precise example of this, we're going to start off with our unsorted pages. We're going to sort within the pages, and we're going to uh, continually merge the pages together to get a bigger and bigger uh, sorted list. Does everyone follow the basic idea? So we take 3, 4, and 2, 6. 2 is the smallest one, and then the next smallest one is 3. That's the size of the page, we output that. Then we keep reading, 4 is the next smallest, we write that. 6 is the next smallest, we write that, and we're done with the page. Move on to the next one, 4 is the smallest, 7 is the next smallest, then 8 is the next smallest, and 9. Uh, 1, then 3, write those, 5, then 6. Understandable? Questions up to this point? Okay, uh, so uh, first question here. Um, I've been describing things with uh, precisely two buffers at a time. Uh, sorry, precisely three buffers in a, at, at a time. How do we generalize this to use an arbitrary number of buffers? Let's say we have a huge amount of memory available. Um, not just uh, two pages, but let's say we have uh, 100 pages. How could we make this more efficient? So how about pass one? How would we make pass one more efficient if we have more memory? We would, we would take, um, we would take, uh, we would take 100 pages together. Yeah, so if we have 100 pages, may as well just sort 100 pages at a time. It's uh, the more, the bigger the initial chunks are, the less work we have to do down the line. Uh, what about uh, later passes? So what about, uh, so how would we make pass two more efficient? Remember the, the data that we're reading in is already mostly sorted. So other than having a small buffer of maybe two or three pages at a time, uh, reading more than two, and three, two or three pages for a single uh, buffer is not going to be all that helpful. So how, uh, let's say we are only reading one, one uh, page in from each of our, our sort of sorted chunks. Um, so we have two of these. That's going to take up two pages. What, el what's, what other data could we read in uh, to make this algorithm more efficient? So we, get, we could read in more data from one of these uh, one of the chunks that we already have in memory. It's going to help us a little bit, but up, only up to a point. Uh, or we could read in data from another chunk. How would that help us? So does a merge need to be over two lists? Exactly. So you can uh, read in multiple streams and merge on each of those streams. Just keep reading the smallest value in any stream. Um, now, assuming we do that, how many passes uh, would we now need to perform? So let's say we have k streams. How many passes would we need to perform? Log base k. Perfect. Um, all right. And how many IOs are required for this? So if the full uh, data, if the full file is, let's say, 100 pages, how many IOs would we need? Let's break it down into stages. How many IOs would we need to compute pass one? Each, each step in pass one uh, reads in a bunch of pages, sorts them, then writes those pages to disk. So how many IOs, IOs is that going to be for the entire file? So if the entire file is, let's say, 100 pages long, how many, uh, sorry, 200, yes, and how did you come about with that? How did you come up with that? Twice. So it's uh, twice, uh, so pass one is going to take twice the number of 
uh, IOs as the file has pages. Um, what about pass two? How many, uh, how it reads two at a time and flushes out one? Well, it, it reads two pages and those two pages are going to gen, I mean, you're not getting rid of data, so you're still going to generate one page for those two. Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, every single pass takes, uh, reads in the entire file and writes the entire file. So you get twice the number of IOs as there are pages in each of the um, pages in the file. Uh, so the total number of operation of IOs that we need is twice the number of pages uh, times the number of passes. Okay, um, so how can we make this even more efficient? Well, can we make pass two all that more efficient? Not really. We're, we're doing this about as efficiently as we can. We're merge uh, is a streaming algorithm. Uh, that's basically we're, we're not going to get much else. This, on the other hand, past one, uh, we can do quite a bit better. Um, so, what, what is what is sort of the big limitation of past one? Memory. Memory. Yes, exactly. Uh, past one read, needs to read a huge amount of stuff in. So if we only have um, n pages of memories, uh, is there any way of uh, generating more than n pages of sorted data? Sort of a rhetorical question, but uh, as it turns out, the answer is yes. Um, so there is a algorithm called replacement sort. And the idea of replacement sort is that we're going to uh, keep sort of a working set in memory. And every time we've sort of created, created one page of sorted data, we're going to flush that to disk and immediately replace it with, uh, with new data um, that we read in. Now, that, that new data might be unsorted. And it might not be possible to take some of that data and put it into this, this sorted file uh, that we've, we've already flushed to disk. Um, but that's perfectly fine. We'll, we'll essentially create what we call a run of sorted data. We'll just keep appending things to a file and keep reading new data in as, um, as it arrives, or sorry, as we get more space for it. Uh, so loosely speaking, basically, if, uh, if you read in a new tuple that can be appended to, safely to the file uh, that we're creating, great. It's, we're just going to append it in sorted order. Uh, otherwise, we'll just keep it and uh, append it to the next file uh, when that comes around. So let me give you a, a sort of example of this. Uh, we have uh, an input buffer. We have a working set that is basically all of the memory that we have available that isn't going to the input buffer or the output buffer. And then we have an output buffer. And the idea is that the output buffer is going to be in perfectly sorted order. We're going to keep track of uh, a number for the output buffer. We're going to call it k, and that's going to be the, the last value that we appended uh, to the output buffer. So step one, we're going to go through our working set and find the lowest value in that working set um, that is greater than uh, the last value we appended to the output buffer. We're going to take that value, we're going to append it to the output buffer and update k. And then we're going to read in another value uh, from our input buffer and make sure update the working set so that it's properly sorted. And this, then this process is just going to repeat over and over and over again until the entire working set uh, contains tuples that are greater than k. When that happens, we will close off the output buffer. That's the end of, of one uh, we call run. And we're going to start, start again with k equal to 0. Any questions on this? Uh, this process stops when the input buffer is empty. Then we just flush the entire working set. Uh, or basically, when both the input buffer and the working set are empty, uh, then we can close off the last output buffer and we're done. Yes? The working set has value. Uh, say again? 
value to a single example? Uh, yes. Very so, uh, so basically, every every value in the working set that is lower than k, or well, that is lower than k, uh, we sort of hold on to, and that sort of buffers up as we get more and more data that can no longer be uh, appended to the output buffer. Now, eventually, we're we're going to have to reset the output buffer and reset k to zero, at which point we start back at the top of the working set. Does that answer your question? Uh, essentially, the same thing. So, if uh, if there was a um, if there was a four here, then we hold on to it until.